Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining the ALS Association's uh, Research Appropriations Webinar. Uh, I'm Jeremy Holden. I'll be your host today. I am a member of the ALS Association's communications team and the host of the Connecting ALS podcast. A uh, quick programming note, you will all have opportunities to ask questions throughout the day. We will have two question and answer session. Please do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can enter questions there and we will uh, share those with our panelists when the time is appropriate. And again, send your questions at any time. We'll be collecting those and and, and sharing them with panelists as uh, as time permits. Uh, but let me now introduce Colony Balas, President and CEO of the ALS Association, who's going to welcome everyone and thank our sponsors. Hi, Jeremy, and thank you for that nice welcome. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this year's 2023 ALS Research Appropriations Webinar. We have a lot of great information and work uh, to do over the not only the coming uh, time together here today, but obviously the coming year um, as we look forward to a, a really robust year in Congress. So first, I just want to welcome you. Thank everyone for being here. I think we have nearly 700 people dialing in, so thank you for for spending your time with us. And before we really get rolling, a few things. I first want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, I always say, and because it's so true, sponsors aren't just about financial support for a certain event or some of the work that we do, but they really are partners in the work that we do month over month, year after year. So our gold level sponsors this year include Amelix and Biogen, Cytokinetics, Genentech, and PTC Bio. Our silver level sponsors this year inc include Apellis, Mitsubishi, Tanabe, Pharma, America. So thank you all for your continued support and your continued work together. I, I don't have to tell this crowd that not only do we believe, but we know that Congress can and really must make a significantly larger investment all across the board to help us find new treatments and cures. And I've said for years that it's, it's pretty easy when you follow the money to understand how treatments and cures get developed. When you invest in it, when you invest in research, you start to understand what's happening, what mechanisms are happening. And before you know it, new treatments and cures are found. And we, we have seen that recently, haven't we? This last year with a new drug being approved, Relivrio, um, that was a very exciting time. And I think we might have some more around the corner, hopefully. We also saw that Radicava introduced an oral um version. And that really helps all of us when we think about trying to make uh, these different therapies accessible. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that tomorrow, I think many of you know, we're going to have yet another ADCOM around a potential new therapy to person. So there are many other drugs in the pipeline, but to find these new treatments and cures, we have to increase the number and the speed of clinical trials. And that's where you come in. Members of Congress, I, I mean, you know this, they're elected by you. They, they listen to your voice. And while you're going to hear from a lot of experts and probably people that you know today, at the end of the day, they're going to listen to what you have to say. People living with ALS, their families, their caregivers living in their district is who is going to in influence Congress. And that's what always does. Your voice is the most powerful voice. There's always a lot of competition out there for research dollars, but that's not going to stop us. It certainly hasn't before. And right as Congress is really starting to begin its process and really determine how it's going to allocate the research dollars this year, I hope that you will continue the fight with us. That's why you're spending your time with us today to make sure that research appropriations for ALS is one of their top priorities. So thank you for leaning in and helping to take action. Over the next time together here, I think the next couple hours, the, what, this webinar, webinar is designed to give you really important information on the role of each of the federal advocacy agencies and how they play into ALS research and why more funding is needed. It's also designed to give you really important information on the role um, that you play 
and and the different types of action alerts and all the different information that's coming your way. So um, I hope you'll take heed and really listen in. As Jeremy said at the top of the hour, there's a Q&A function. Don't be afraid to use it. That's why we're here. We're here to help you as you really lean into Congress and ask them to help us in the fight against ALS. So now I'm going to introduce two really special people. First is Nancy Lamond. Nancy joined our board not too long after her husband, Stephen, uh, passed away from ALS in 2019. Uh, Nancy is also the chair of our public policy committee, and she's really well known on Capitol Hill as the executive vice president of AARP and its chief, chief advocacy and engagement officer um, for, for the community state, sorry, for community, state, and national affairs. Nancy, you've got such a long, uh, impressive title. It's a lot to get out in, in one, one sentence here. So thank you for joining us. And our second really special guest uh, that I get to introduce is Jesse Ibarra. And Jesse is the vice chair of our public policy committee. Jesse served in the United States Air Force and is really not just awesome guy, but a dedicated family guy. His journey began with ALS in 2015 at the age of 51. He's an enthusiastic advocate. I uh, love talking to him any day of the week. He's an inspiration to all of us. And he really chooses to live his life in this optimistic mindset. So Jesse, thank you for joining us. And now, Nancy, I think I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Kalanita. More importantly, thank you to... Uh, all of you who are giving us uh, the gift of your time today. As Kelly mentioned, I'm a member of the board, chair of the public policy committee, but most importantly, I'm part of the community we all share. Uh, nine years ago, my husband was diagnosed with ALS. My sons, a group of wonderful home care workers, and I cared for him in our home for six years, and he died in late 2019. Um, I understand, our family understands the challenges of ALS from the perspective of a patient and a family caregiver. But as Kalanit mentioned, I also understand ALS and its advocacy because of my day job. Um, I run the advocacy and lobbying operations uh, for AARP in Washington, D.C., and in state capitals across the country. And I know from that experience uh, firsthand how important it is to bring the voice and faces of patients and their caregivers to policymakers. Um, again, I'm kind of repeating what Kalanit said and frankly what you all probably know, but no one is better at telling the story and compelling action than all of you. Uh, today, we're talking about making the case to our members of Congress and to uh, leaders in the executive branch for more research money for ALS and a more heightened effort to find a cure. Uh, thanks so much to those of you who've kept fighting for action and who've engaged in advocacy. Um, these days, it's awfully easy to get cynical about Washington and politics. I know that, I talk to our members every single day, but don't do that. Don't stop your demands for investment. Every single step you take to fight for a cure for this disease will be noticed and it will make a difference, uh, perhaps only a small one at times, but a difference nonetheless. And put together all of these so-called small actions will lead to important steps uh, forward. Uh, none of us can afford to let up in the pressure we bring. And let me tell you, as somebody whose members are uh, blessed with lots of diseases, I can assure you that all organizations representing uh, various patients are pushing ahead full steam and we need to do the same. So continue to respond to e-alerts from the ALS Association, asking for you to contact your member of Congress, offer to visit policymakers at uh, their offices back home, let them see and understand firsthand uh, the challenges with this disease. Um, I'm asking for something you don't have much to spare, and that's your time. But trust me, every action, every step you take is going to be important to you and the rest of the ALS community. Uh, specifically, I want to ask everyone on this call to invite five people to become advocates 
by signing up with the Action Center. And as I finish in a minute, uh, someone's gonna provide instructions on how you actually can do that. Um, I also wanna offer, if anybody wants to put a question um, in the chat or follow up, I'm happy to talk to anyone about advocacy, kind of our experience, um, what reactions you can expect. Um, delighted to, to do that. I know for many of you, you're old hands at this. For others, it's a somewhat intimidating new territory. Uh, but finally, I mostly wanna thank all of you for what you've done. And importantly, thank you for what all of you will continue to do. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it to somebody who can help you uh, sign up. Uh, thanks, Nancy, and, th and thanks, Colony, for helping set the stage for this incredibly important conversation around advocacy and the role that it plays in, in our mission. Um, as Nancy mentioned, we will have uh, opportunities and links down the road on how you can sign up to become an advocate, so stay tuned for that. Uh, another quick reminder that we are fielding questions, and we'll be kicking them to panelists uh, when the time is appropriate. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Neil Thacker, Chief Mission Officer of the ALS Association, so we can talk about the role that advocacy plays in advancing our mission. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be talking with all of you. just want to make sure I can see myself here. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about our strategy. Uh, I'm going to give you a high-level overview. And then Melanie is going to talk about our particular advocacy ask that we're uh, focusing on for the next uh, round of visits with the Hill. And then uh, Paul is going to talk about our research agenda so you can see how that dovetails with our advocacy agenda. And then we're going to get into um, all the nuts and bolts about how to engage directly. Uh, that's so important, as, as uh, Nancy was alluding to, that people hear from you uh, directly about your experiences and um, what, what our lawmakers can do to um, uh, help fight ALS. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So our uh, focus of our goal is to make um, ALS a livable disease until we can find cures for everyone everywhere. And the reason why we put a timeline on this uh, is as you'll see, it's really important that we give our lawmakers and our scientists and our, our, all the other research funders uh, concrete, way, concrete ways that, and, uh, to think about what they have to do and the sequence they have to do them so we can help everyone everywhere. And when we say livable, and I'm gonna define this, what we're really meaning is a rapid and a really fundamental transformation in um, the experience of having ALS. Uh, it's the change. We, the status quo for ALS care is not good enough, and we need to make that change happen very quickly. So what do we mean by livable? Uh, if you click, click again, Tamara, please. Um, we mean people living f longer lives than they are today, that we have more life-extending treatments, that people are able to access care that's going to help um, them live a longer life. If you click again, please. We also mean a significantly improved quality of life. So people are able to engage with the world the way that they want with more independence. And so it's not up to any organization, any government agency to tell people what good quality of life is. People get to decide that for themselves. And that, that aspect of autonomy uh, is really important in everything we do. Uh, also that we have reduced uh, burdens of ALS. As you know, ALS is a very uh, is a motor neuron disease, but it affects every aspect of family life. So there are physical burdens, emotional burdens for the person with ALS and for their caregivers, and also a tremendous financial burden. And so uh, a comprehensive plan to make ALS livable means that those things are significantly eased. And then also we need to think about preventing new cases of ALS, because the reasons why someone has ALS, the genetic risks, the environmental risks, the occupational risks, are shared by people that they, they love. Those folks also have elevated risk for ALS. And we need to find ways uh, to reduce those risks uh, to even treat people earlier if possible. And so a core aspect of that strategy, uh, Colony mentioned a genetic therapy that's uh, up for discussion by the FDA tomorrow, uh, does require people to understand their genetic um, status, uh, but it also means that they shouldn't have to choose between their financial uh, health and their their um, physical health, and so we we are working on the laws uh, to to alleviate the risks of genetic testing, but we're also uh, working really hard to provide counseling for folks for free 
so they can uh, weigh the risks and benefits of getting testing themselves. Can you go to the next slide, please? So how are we gonna do this? And, and I think an important thing to, to remember is that ALS is, is a real monster. And, and I say that because there's no one magical thing that we can do. There's no silver bullet. There's no magic wand that's going to make ALS better. Uh, we're going to have to do a number of things at the same time, all with modest effects. And together, they will add up into that transformative impact that we're looking for um, until we find a cure for everyone uh, to make ALS livable for everyone everywhere. And so to do that, we're going to do three things. We're going to have to find new treatments and cures. We're going to have to optimize the care that we have and make sure people can get it. And then we're going to have to prevent ALS and delay the harms to get uh, of, that come with ALS. And that's how we're going to make ALS livable. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, when we, we talk about these things, finding new treatments and cures, optimizing care, and preventing ALS and its harms, we have a lot of tools to do this. Uh, Paul is gonna talk uh, in, in a little bit of detail about what our research strategies are. And that's gonna be really helpful for you to understand that our research plan is also comprehensive and, and fairly broad. And that our care services program is part of that. Not only is it our way to provide people high quality care, but it's also a way to support our research enterprise. And then Melanie, uh, Melanie will come next to talk about our advocacy plan about how these things fit together. And they do fit together in surprising ways. And I'll just give you a little example, uh, if you can just go back a slide, about how they all fit together. So for example, we, we've had a, a large natural history study that was funded by the FDA, I believe last year. That started by just a group of our uh, ALS certified clinics working together to figure out how they can uh, combine their records and get a better understanding of how people are living with ALS. We gave them a pilot grant through our research program to formalize some of their work and move, move that, that project ahead. And then that project got funded by a uh, grant from the FDA, which was funded through the Act for ALS, uh, which we all worked to, to get passed. And so these, these different program elements of the association do work together. Uh, we need to keep working together and they can have uh, surprising and transformative effects. So let me uh, uh, switch uh, gears now to the next slide and to Melly Lendenall, who's the head of our advocacy program to talk about uh, our landscape. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, and thank you again to everyone who has joined us here today. As Colonite mentioned, the single most important thing that we all can do is to advocate for what we want from the people who we elected to represent us. So with that, let's take a, 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 a leap into what the political landscape looks like today. So first, we all know that the political landscape has changed this year, both at the federal and state levels of government. Right now, we have divided control since Republicans have control of the House. And at the state level, Republicans have control of both chambers and the executive branch in 22 states. Democrats have full control in 17 states, and that means only 10 states have divided control. And so for my math friends out there, yes, that only adds up to 49, and that's because Nebraska with a unicameral legislature is technically considered nonpartisan, but practically speaking, Republicans do have a majority. So for today, let's just focus on what's happening at the federal level. The most important change as it concerns what we're doing for appropriations work is the fact that a rule called cut go, which technically means cut as you go, is back in the House. This requires mandatory spending increases to offset only with equal or greater decreases in mandatory spending. I know that was a, a mouthful and no new taxes are allowed. The overall goal here is to prevent adding to the deficit. So what does that mean for us? It means that we are facing a tougher environment to get increases in appropriations since that money will have to come from somewhere else if we are getting more. So 
Before we get into the specifics of what we're asking for, let's talk about how these requests fit into our overall strategy. So if we could take the next slide here. As we all know, our goal is to make ALS livable by 2030. And in order to achieve that goal, we must work urgently by pulling all of the levers available to us. So for example, focusing not just on all levels of government, but also in all branches of government. And that's exactly what we're doing. Today, we're just going to be focusing on our work at the congressional level. So first, we, we have our first pillar, which is finding new treatments of, and cures. Um, you know, certainly that means investing into research. Our second pillar that, that you see here is optimizing current treatments and care and preventing or delaying the harms of ALS. Asking for $150 million for ALS research at the National Institutes of Health hits all three of those pillars, which is why what we are talking about today is so important. First and foremost, we have to work with members of Congress to secure as much funding as possible for research and for care services, primarily at the state level. So that's state legislatures. And then second, it means that we're simultaneously working to make it as easy and as seamless as possible for people living with ALS and their families to get what they need. So simply put, that means ensuring, ensuring access, ensuring affordability, primarily by removing barriers. And that's what you see highlighted here on your screen. So ensuring that people can get faster access to drugs, treatments, and therapies. That is done primarily through what we call eliminating prior authorization barriers, ensuring health insurance coverage, full coverage. So that means things like people who have Medicare, who are under 65, that they have access to Medicare supplement plans in all states, not just the half the states in the country that currently require it. It means telehealth, wherever you are. So if you are in Montana, you can talk to a doctor in Colorado. So telehealth across state lines. And then when we get into preventing or delaying harms of ALS, it means preventing insurance practices that increase costs of care. It means ensuring that people who are living with ALS can easily travel. And it, ensure, it means providing that critical support to caregivers wherever they are. Insurance coverage for genetic testing and genetic counseling, and of course, preventing any kind of insurance discrimination, whether it's health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance, or long-term care insurance. Over the years, you know, we, we have made, we have achieved so much success together. Some examples, our DOD request started at 10 million. Now we're at 40 million and we're going to ask to try and double that this year. NIH funding for ALS research was boosted from 48 million in 2014 to 120 million. That's a massive increase. And of course, ACT for ALS is 75 million and 25 million for the FDA. That is just one of the many examples of everything that we've achieved by working together. And hopefully we will continue achieving phenomenal results as we have in the past for everyone living with ALS, regardless of where they live and for all of their family members. So with that, Jeremy, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thanks, Melanie. And thank you, Neil, uh, for a great overview on uh, kind of the state of advocacy and, and the role that it plays in helping us achieve our mission. Before we move things along, I know we were all hoping to hear from Jesse Ibarra today. Unfortunately, Jesse is a little bit under the weather and unable to join us. Uh, we're obviously sending in best wishes for a speedy and full recovery. Um, 
Next up, we are going to hear from Representative Jason Crow, a member of Congress from Colorado. Representative Crow is a longtime champion for people living with ALS and their families, and one of the sponsors of our bipartisan ALS research Dear Colleague letter. Hi, Jason Crow here, representative for Colorado's 6th District. I want to thank everyone at the ALS Association and all who have supported the movement to fund innovative research and treatment to fight ALS. As the co-chair of the ALS Caucus, I'm grateful for your dedication, commitment, and hope to advance our critical mission to deliver effective treatments and provide high-quality care to patients battling ALS. I'm proud of our progress to get the Accelerating Access to Critical Therapies for ALS Act over the finish line. This authorizes grants for research and therapy development and helps more patients, not in clinical trials, access ALS therapies. The DOD, VA, and NIH have found that people who served in the military are up to twice as likely to develop and die from ALS. That's why I helped lead efforts to call for a significant increase of federal funding across multiple agencies with a total investment of 225 million. Now, this investment includes 75 million for the National Institutes of Health to conduct ALS research with expanded access to grants for the Act for ALS Act. It includes 80 million for medical research programs at the Department of Defense, 15 million for the CDC ALS registry, and 25 million at FDA for Act for ALS research grants. After 80 years, researchers still don't know why thousands of Americans get ALS every year. But together, we're going to continue to bring awareness to ALS, develop innovative treatments and therapies to fight this disease, and provide ALS patients with access to high quality care. Thank you for your hard work. I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Paul Larkin, Director of Research for the ALS Association. Paul, you have the floor. Thanks, Jeremy. Great to be here today. Today, I'm going to talk about congressional funding in the ALS research ecosystem. And to do that, I'd like to start on the next slide with a quick overview of our funding process here at the ALS Association, because we are the largest philanthropic funder of ALS research. So our process starts with identifying areas of need. And I think this is really a strength for our organization versus other funders, perhaps in particular government funders, because we are able to tap into our deep connections to the community of people living with ALS and of researchers in ALS and of uh, drug developers and industry partners throughout ALS as well. And when we are then able to identify gaps or opportunities that would benefit from funding, we have the ability to pivot quickly towards those areas and devote funding to them to really drive the research ecosystem forward in the directions that we think it needs to go. So once we've identified those areas, our, our process is to then request and review applications that are focused on the areas of need. We do have rigorous internal and external review of those applications. And then ultimately we fund the best projects that we find wherever they are around the world or in whatever sort of lab, academic labs, industry labs, or what have you. So that's an abstract overview of, of what we do. And then in the next slide, I wanted to make that a little bit more concrete by showing what happened in 2022 here at the association. We issued seven different requests for applications on a variety of topics. We reviewed 245 applications from around the world. And ultimately we committed about $15 million to fund 59 new projects. And those projects span the entire ALS research ecosystem. And I could certainly spend a lot of time uh, talking about why we chose the specific projects and the specific topic areas that we did choose, but that's the talk for another day. And so instead today, what I'd like to do on the next slide is start with an overview of what I mean when I talk about the ALS research ecosystem. So this slide has a fair amount going on, but there's no need to absorb all the detail here. There are just a couple of points that I wanted to emphasize for the rest of the talk here. And that's starting with what you can see in the left and the right, I've kind of divided this between drug development and managing ALS. And that distinction is a bit arbitrary because certainly drug development impacts management of ALS and practice for managing ALS can impact drug development as well. So all of these things are interconnected, but for today, the government funders that I'll be discussing for the next couple of minutes are primarily focused on drug development. So that's where I wanna spend most of my time as well. 
And the point that I want to make there with the drug development pipeline, as I've outlined it on the left, is that I've drawn this as a funnel sort of proceeding from left to right, because drug development often does work in this relatively linear, relatively step-by-step -step type of fashion, where investments in basic biology, what I've labeled biology and genetics of ALS or risk and causes of ALS are necessary, and we need to get success in that arena before moving to the early steps of drug development, and then before moving to the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials that I'm sure you've all heard of, uh, that are the steps that ultimately, if everything goes right, would lead to drug approval. Um, so with that stepwise fashion, the implication there is that we really need to fund all these different steps of the drug development process in order to have this pipeline moving with the speed and efficiency that we need in ALS. So that said, in the next slide, what I want to do here is just show where we're going for the next couple of slides is that I'm going to go through each of these four main government funders of ALS research, the NIH, the CDC, the Department of Defense, and the FDA, and position them within this ALS uh, research ecosystem. And so to be clear, the numbers I'm showing here are the fiscal year 23 funding numbers. And of course, as will be detailed throughout the rest of the day, we're asking for more funding uh, for fiscal year 24 and beyond. So next to start with uh, the biggest funder, the next slide shows the NIH. And so they currently have $120 million budget and that does span the entirety of the research system uh, nominally, but as you can see in the pie graph, and as I've tried to illustrate with the other circle in the upper left there, they really do focus most of their research funding on the basic biology of ALS, uh, the biology and genetics of ALS, and some as well on early uh, therapeutic discovery and development. And so these steps are obviously hugely important. These are the foundation of the rest of the drug development pipeline. Uh, but again, to emphasize the stepwise nature of this, if you only fund there, then you won't advance to drugs. And so it's important to fund all steps of the pipeline. And NIH is really focused at this first level, even though they do have some projects across the rest of the ecosystem as well. Um, on the next slide, I wanted to show CDC and their $10 million budget, which is focused really exclusively on the risk and causes of ALS. And so actually one more click camera, um, thank you. In addition to being part of the sort of traditional drug development pipeline, the CDC's efforts on risk and causes of ALS are really important for prevention of ALS, which as Neil introduced previously, is a really important organizational goal for us. And so this is an example of where we have identified a bit of a gap in the funding environment where CDC is funding risk and causes of ALS and so we've decided to then fund the next steps of taking that information, taking the information about which risks and which causes lead to ALS and translating that into actions that could ultimately lead to uh, prevention of ALS. And so what they're doing is, is foundational for that work. And we certainly um, hope to help them improve their efforts over time as well. In the next slide, uh, I wanted to move to the Department of Defense and actually one more click here tomorrow as well. Thank you. Um, this is a, a relatively long running program at the Department of Defense where they have been investing primarily in preclinical drug development. And what's great about this program is that it's been going on long enough that they've been able to see success and some really exciting results with the preclinical programs that they have funded and the biomarker development programs that they have funded as well. And so now what that program is trying to do and what we'd like to help them try to do is expand their efforts beyond the preclinical arena and move into early clinical trials into these phase one clinical trials. And it's important to point out that clinical research is much more expensive than the steps that come before it. And so in order to help them build on their success in the preclinical space, it's going to be quite expensive to move into those phase one clinical trials. And so uh, we really think it's important to boost that funding level so that they're able to take that next step. Um, next, uh, next slide, actually, uh, I wanted to talk about the FDA. And here, they currently only have about a $5 million budget. And this is, this is relatively new funding, primarily from the Act for ALS, which is devoted to improving clinical trials. And so this funding is also very important 
because as you can see, it's really the only funding that's focused on phase two and phase three clinical trials within that drug development pipeline. And what's interesting here is that uh, this number is relatively small, despite the fact that phase two and phase three trials are incredibly expensive. And I think that's okay because ultimately phase two and phase three clinical trials are going to be funded by industry, by pharma and biotech companies, and not by nonprofits like us or even the federal government because their budgets just aren't large enough. The amounts of money that are needed for phase two and phase three clinical development need to come from industry partners. And so that's what FDA can do is help to encourage those industry partners to develop drugs in ALS versus in other disease areas. And they can do that by improving um, the processes for clinical trials in a variety of ways and in a variety of ways that touch on things that I've labeled as managing ALS as well. But ultimately there should be, we believe, a, a multiplier effect of FDA investment in clinical trial processes because to the extent that they can make that process easier, they'll draw industry dollars into ALS drug development as well. Um, so last, on uh, the next slide, I wanted to bring all these circles back and just highlight the fact that each of these different government agencies is investing in ALS research in a different piece of the ALS research ecosystem. And we believe that all of these pieces, again, must be functioning at a high level in order for the pipeline as a whole to function at a high level. And so we at the association uh, work to fill in any gaps that we perceive and work to lead the way towards new opportunities. And we think that if we can continue to do that and continue to have the support of Congress for more funding for these crucial programs, uh, that we can have this, this drug development pipeline moving more quickly and advancing towards more treatments and ultimately a cure for ALS much more quickly as well. Uh, so I'll stop there and hand things back to Jeremy. Thanks, Paul, and thanks for that great overview of the ALS um, research program. Um, <clears throat> as the slide says, we are now at the Q&A session. I uh, got a lot of great questions coming in. Some of these are going to be addressed in the subsequent panel. So if we don't get to your question right now, we will get to it in the next, pan ne next Q&A session, or it may be addressed in uh, upcoming discussions. Um, one of the questions that we got, uh, and I'm, Neil, I'm going I'm to throw this to you. But could you tell us a little bit more about the Act for ALS funding for expanded access? How is NIH's expanded access program different from its clinical research programs? Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, so expanded access, of course, is a, hopefully you can see me. Um, uh, expanded access is a means to uh, give people access to experimental drugs uh, before they've been approved by the FDA because they, they are experimental. And so expanded access provides funding to NIH to set up those processes and provide that the administration and also collect data so we have some additional information on how these uh, drugs are working. And, and as you can imagine, um, it's difficult to run expanded access programs because you're basically bypassing an incredibly large infrastructure of pharmacists and pharmacies to get people uh, medication and this is a different process. You're going through your physician and, and sort of a side channel. And so it's, it's hard to do that. Uh, the NIH got funding to do um, expanded access and they've so far, they've only been able to fund one project uh, and reach 70 people only uh, for, and provide support for 70 people for several years. They have a new call for applications out that'll start in May. And hopefully they'll find a way to uh, deliver experimental drugs to more people. Um, that means these folks aren't in a clinical trial. Uh, they're not eligible to be in a clinical trial, so we're not competing uh, with other trials for recruitment, and um, we'll collect some data. So this is really uh, our best chance uh, to see if expanded access can make a real difference for people with ALS, and we're gonna have to see how it, it plays out. Thanks for that, Neil. Uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A around state funding and the importance of that. For the sake of everybody's time, we're focused today exclusively on, on Congress at the federal level, federal spending. But I think everybody on the call, everybody, every panelist agrees uh, the importance of reaching out to state lawmakers as well. Um, 
question from a panelist or a question, uh, Neil, I might direct this one to you, maybe to Paul, uh, but what is actually extending the lives of ALS patients? What are the most recent? What's available? What are you seeing in terms of research breakthroughs and, and, and extending lives of patients? Well, why don't I talk about what's available now, Paul, and you can talk about what's in the pipeline a little bit. Um, there are uh, three drugs which are approved specifically for ALS. And uh, when they were approved, uh, Radicavra and Rilizol all showed um, impacts on survival time, increasing survival time. Um, and I'm sorry, Relibrio and, and Rilizol. And uh, we've been looking at the uh, effects of Radicava in the real world, and we're seeing some evidence that people on Radicava are also able to live longer. On top of that, high quality care, uh, the multidisciplinary care from the centers that we certify, MDA also has a multidisciplinary ALS treatment centers, they also extend life. And what's interesting is all of these things work in different ways biologically. And so it's very likely that together these drugs have additive effects and perhaps even beyond additive effects. And that's part of the research that we need to figure out how to optimize care. And then we have uh, other drugs that are in the pipeline. Um, Paul, do you wanna talk about that? Sure, and I would say what brings those drugs together is that a lot of them are targeted therapies. And so that can be targeted towards a uh, specific mutation. So if a, if a person with ALS has a specific mutation in a specific gene. There are a couple of therapies that are in the pipeline, including by so person, which is which is quite advanced in the pipeline, that are targeted towards uh, that that specific mutation. And I think that approach in general has a lot of potential. Uh, there are also other targeted therapies where it's not necessary to have a specific mutation, but uh, clinicians would look at specific biomarkers to see whether or not a specific person with ALS has the biomarker that predicts response to that drug. And uh, those therapies, I think both the ones that are targeted to specific mutations and the ones that are targeted to specific biomarkers are really promising because once you can identify a patient that is more likely to respond, then uh, that response is more likely to be sort of more complete and really extend survival uh, rather than perhaps for all spectrum approaches, though there are several of those that are, that are in, in development, both in preclinical development and in later stages of clinical trials that have potential as well. Thank you both for that. Um, <clears throat> we have a question about the, uh, the, the registry uh, and, and why that is important to, to the work and to the mission. I can take a stab at it and then Paul and Emily, you can fill in. Uh, the, the registry is really the only federally funded program in the US focused on what causes ALS. And that's the fundamental work necessary to prevent ALS. And if you go on their website, uh, which is now a lot better than it was a few years ago, you'll see that they funded a number of studies uh, to document risk factors. and. Um, we need to know what those are. We need to keep pushing uh, our science of prevention so we can answer the question of what does it mean for my family when I have an ALS diagnosis? Are they going to get ALS and what can we do to reduce their risk? We, we need to have clear answers for that. And so to push that along, we're proposing in this next funding cycle an additional $5 million for the registry specifically to study ways to prevent ALS among veterans and active duty soldiers. As uh, the Congressman mentioned earlier, uh, veterans and, and military personnel have an elevated risk for ALS. And we have some sense of why that is. We identified some causes, but we don't have a risk mitigation, risk reduction strategy to reduce incidents. So it's time to study that, it's time to move forward. And the registry is the right group to do that. And I think they can collaborate with the DOD and the VA to do that if they have some funding to uh, make that happen. That's right, Neil. And I think that to elaborate a little bit further, this really goes to the heart of that third pillar that you all saw on the slide um, that, that when I spoke to you all earlier uh, of prevention. Um, as Neil mentioned, th this is how we are able to determine what causes ALS 
so that we can hopefully find better treatments and a cure. To be sure, the association is heavily focused on making life as good as it possibly can be for people who are living with ALS and all of their family members right now. But we also believe that we have an obligation to all of the people who may be diagnosed in the future until there is a cure to try and do everything that we can to determine why people are getting ALS, what causes ALS, so that we can get to that prevention element as urgently as possible. I think those are both great answers. I think the only thing I would add is that um, in this effort to identify risk factors, bigger is better. And the registry is the largest project running. And so the more uh, participation that there is in that registry, the more power we'll have to identify new risk factors and take the next steps that Neil and Melanie are talking about. Melanie, I'm pretty sure this one is going right over to you. Uh, what do we know about Medicare coverage and maybe expand it out beyond to uh, other insurance coverage of oral radicava, of relivrio, and other drugs that may come through uh, and, and become approved? Uh, thank you to whoever asked that question. This, this is critically important, especially as we are looking forward to a future where hopefully more treatments will be coming to market and, and available for people um, living with ALS. So first I will say uh, Arwadakava as well as Relivrio are approved to be covered by Medicare. Um, you know, when it comes to other types of insurance, I, I think it comes as no surprise to everyone who is here today that sometimes those other insurances uh, present more barriers uh, and make it more difficult, primarily through um, a, a, a process I mentioned earlier called prior authorization, which at the end of the day, what it amounts to is putting barriers in the path of people living with ALS seeking to access these treatments that are approved by the FDA. Um, we, we are engaged with uh, payers across the country to do everything that we can to ensure that people are able to access all FDA approved treatments as quickly as possible um, without having to jump through all the hoops that sometimes we know payers put in front of patients. Um, uh, if, if you follow us and, and subscribe to our emails, you probably are aware that, that there is one payer, Cigna, right now, um, who has unfortunately put a policy in place that makes it incredibly difficult for people living with ALS to access Relivrio. We are working incredibly closely with them. Um, we've had many uh, meetings with them about this, and I am hopeful that we will be able to ultimately move this all in the right direction. But thank you to whoever asked that question, incredibly important. I had a feeling you might like that question, Melanie. Um, a couple questions I'm gonna to try to combine together. So hopefully to those who pose these questions, I'm doing justice to what you're, you're trying to get at. But how do we make a determination of how much money we're gonna ask Congress to appropriate for different programs and, and just across the board? Why not? Yeah, you know, it's sort of a mix of political um, feasibility and uh, scientific and clinical need. Um, so that you know, for example, the 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 prevention story, the prevention example with the registry, there's clearly a scientific opportunity there that wasn't available, wasn't wasn't reasonable or realistic uh, a few years ago. But the science has advanced. The registry has advanced its science. Uh, we've advanced our own prevention science. And so uh, we feel confident that that money will be well spent, uh, whereas we wouldn't have uh, thought that, I think, a few years ago. So that's, that's an example of the scientific uh, need. And I think Paul did a great job of showing how there's clear underinvestment in quality of care uh, work. And there's a lot that could be done there if uh, NIH were to put the money in there. So that's a scientific need. Uh, but Melanie, maybe you want to talk about the political uh, realities that we're we're working in and how we're always uh, negotiating there. 
I, I think the political realities are a critical component here. Uh, to be sure, I would love to go to members of Congress and ask for $10 billion for, for ALS research. Um, but we would lose credibility with members of Congress if, if, if we did that, um, particularly in, in this political environment. So we try when it comes to figuring out what those specific uh, monetary figures look like, we're trying to balance credibility and also, as Neil said, basing it off the real real need from a scientific perspective and to be able to make that case that we need this additional funding in this amount and as a result we are going to get x um, the political realities are, are tricky uh, and and they're constantly changing um, we, we know that this landscape is tough uh, i i said that earlier uh, with cut go with um you know, the, the House being controlled by Republicans right now and that specific rule coming back into place. So we are doing the absolute best we can with all of the barriers, the, the troubles that, that are being thrown in our path. With that said, um, the good news is there is bipartisan support for investing in research for ALS. This is not something that is one party or another. ALS does not care whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, a, a Libertarian, an Independent. Um, so to that extent, we do know that we have bipartisan support. It's just going to be a matter of figuring out how Congress is going to prioritize and balance all of the competing interests that they have. Thanks for that, Melanie. Um, we have a question about the one of the slides that showed the the amount of money spent on the different agencies on ALS. Is that the totality of the money spent at at, at, NIH, at, D, at NIH at DOD at the different agencies? Is that the entire amount that is spent on ALS? So the numbers that I was showing, at least in my presentation, were the projections for fiscal year twenty three. For for ALS only, not not the total budgets of those agencies. Right. Yes. Uh, Paul, while we have you on, a couple questions about the uh, the drug pipeline, the drug development pipeline. Are we able to have a sense of which drugs are potentially targeting targeting different phases of the of the journey of late late in the progress, um, specific genetic mutations? Um, do we have a breakdown like that? So is there a breakdown of specific drugs that are targeting sort of earlier or later phases of disease progression? Yeah, that's that's I think that's kind of what the questions are getting at. I'm trying to combine yeah. a couple into one for sake of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there I would say that I, I think there are certainly drugs that are going to be more effective than others at later stages of disease. But by and large, the consensus in the field is that the earlier you can give a drug, the more time it will have to have an effect and the larger effect you'll be able to see. And so that gets to you know, something that's been very important here at the organization is time to diagnosis and really speeding that process along as quickly as possible so that people can get on therapies as soon as possible. Um, so though that is the general consensus, there are certainly some drugs that are uh, more likely to be effective later in the disease. And that's probably based on the specific scientific biological mechanisms that they're targeting, because not the same, the same mechanisms are not active throughout the entirety of the course of the disease. So maybe a therapy that's targeting a specific mutation may be more effective earlier in the course of the disease, because mutations are often the causative factors in the disease. And so that starts early versus uh, a therapy that may target something like neuroinflammation, which is something that comes on board later in the disease. So there, um, while they would still be effect more effective if given earlier, uh, there needs to be neuroinflammation present. So the disease needs to be at a relatively later stage before those drugs could have an effect. So certainly the biology dictates when certain drugs are going to be more or less useful. But again, the consensus is that earlier is better for essentially all of these. 
Uh, well, Neil, Melanie, Paul, that is all the time that we have for Q&A right now. A lot more good questions in the Q&A, so we'll try to get to those later in the programming. Uh, but now I'm going to pass things off to Denise Balin, Director of Congressional Affairs, and she's going to tell us about the Dear Colleague letter and why it's so important to securing funding for ALS research. We have the funding, we have the doctors, we have the people that are passionate about this, and we really need to get more uh, funding in, for research and funding for helping them develop different treatments. Um, even if it's just to delay the symptoms, um, gosh, if I could have bought us a few more months with my mom, I would have been on board 100%. I knew when she would pass that I thought, this is when I'm, I'm stepping up She's not here, but I'm going to do it because I know she would fight to keep on trying to find a cure or trying to find something to help people. Well, I really mucked that up. That was not Denise Balin, uh, but now, joining us now is Denise Balin, Director of Congressional Affairs, and she's going to tell us why a Dear Colleague letter is so important for funding for ALS research. Yes, I am Denise Phelan. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about what we are asking Congress to do for people living with ALS and their families. That is to increase government funding for ALS research. So you saw what is being done with the current funding. There's a lot of positive movement forward, but a lot more needs to be done to find new treatments and cures, prevent ALS, and optimize care for people living with ALS. Congress needs to increase the funding for ALS research. Congress needs to invest in our future like they've invested in other diseases that have seen real progress in treatments and cures. So if we can go to the next slide. So how can we do all of this? Right now, Congress is accepting requests from constituents and organizations for their appropriations. We've been sending a lot of requests to members of Congress asking for increased funding for ALS research. Also, the president shared his suggested spending recommendation. Um, this is called the president's budget. So they work together, but they every each year, Congress and the president have to come to an agreement on how they will fund the government. Their deadline is September 30th. So now is the time for us to make our ask on ALS research. We must tell Congress to increase ALS research funding. So I'll provide you an overview on how you can do that and how much we're asking for. So if we can go to the next slide. All right, so now I'm going to talk about appropriation and a tool Congress uses to build support for an issue on Capitol Hill called a Dear Colleague Letter. Truly, it is a letter. Well, it was a letter. Most of the time, it's an email. Um, and it's, I consider it a congressional petition. Members of Congress ask their colleagues in, in Congress to sign a letter in support of an issue. The ALS community has tremendous support from Congress. And there is an annual Dear Colleague Letter uh, for ALS Research Appropriation. The House letter is out right now, so we're hoping to get more signers, and soon there'll be a Senate letter too. So I have to say there are some great leaders in the House who are leading this letter on the behalf of people living with ALS and their loved ones. Congressman Gallagher from Wisconsin, as you saw, Congressman Crow from Colorado, Congressman Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, and Congressman Courtney from Connecticut. Um, we already have over 50 signers. Um, so a lot has been done, but we're gonna talk about what we're gonna ask for and how you can make that impact on Capitol Hill too. So if we can go to the next slide. So what really does a dear colleague do? Um, and what's in our ALS dear colleague right now? In our Dear Colleague letter, we ask representatives to support increased funding for ALS research. I will go over the details of every single one of those requests. 
But why we need everyone on this webinar right now is to learn what to ask for because the deadline to sign this letter is tomorrow, but we will be throughout now into the end of September. This is when we reach for this dear colleague letter and say, we need this increased funding. So with more signers on the letter, that means there's increased likelihood that we can get more research funding for ALS this year. And you can make a huge impact by asking for more funding for research too. So if we can go to the next slide. So what is in all the, my, 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 my requests of uh, Congress and this dear colleague? So I'm gonna review the four government departments that we are asking for increased funding for ALS research. Paul reviewed you, them with you about what is currently being funded and the progress they're making. But I'm here to say, why are we asking Congress to increase their funding. So first, we'll talk about the Department of Defense. I always ask myself, why the Department of Defense? Well, that is because military veterans are more likely to develop ALS than the general public, regardless of the time they served. Um, because the impact ALS has had on the veteran and military community, the ALS has dedicated research on ALS, and they focus only on ALS. It grants money to research who um, to provide uh, to researchers who have a really solid idea to find new treatments and cures. And right now it's funded at 40 million, but that can only fund 25% of the grant proposals they get every year. But with more funding mm -hmm. and more grants can be distributed. And they could also build onto a program to support clinical trials. As we know, that is the next step we need to make sure we get newer treatments and cures to us um, as soon as possible. So what is our ask? Our number one ask is to support $80 million at the Department of Defense for ALS research. That's our first ask. All right, next one is something that many of you may know already, the National Institutes of Health, NIH. It's a top government research organization, and it's the largest public funder of ALS at 120 million estimated is what they're gonna get this year. Um, so NIH support ALS research that focuses on similar areas that we here at the ALS Association focus on too. The development of new treatments and cures, optimize current treatments and care, prevent and delay the harms associated with ALS. NIH is great at research on developing new treatments and cures, but we need more funding so they can also focus on the other areas, prevention and optimizing care and diagnosis and um, preventing diagnosis delays. We need to invest more at NIH. That is why in our dear colleague letter, our ask is to increase it by 30 million to 150 million this year. So that was ask number two. Ask number three is at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. It's the largest prevention research program for ALS. I think we've already discussed the need for prevention methods and risk strategies. So with their current 10 million in funding, the CDC maintains the National ALS Registry and Biorepository, which connects patients to clinical trials and research to biological samples. They also count how many people have the disease. And the rest of the money also goes, pardon me, goes to research, causes of ALS, risk associated with developing ALS, and how to prevent ALS. More research on how to prevent ALS is truly necessary. That is why we are asking for an increase in funding at the CDC so they can carry out an initiative to prevent ALS for veterans. We need more research and, and focus on why our military is likely to get ALS from the general public. All right, next slide. Pardon me as I'm not crying. Okay, so as we all know, the Act for ALS Act it passed in December 2021 because of your advocacy on Capitol Hill. In the bill, 
it said Congress can spend $100 million a year to support the program they have listed in the bill. Great, but we have only gotten up to 80 million so far. We are need the 100 million to make the biggest impact for people living with ALS now who can have access to experimental therapies, an impact for people in the future with research sponsored by the FDA that speeds the development of drugs. So we're asking for 75 million for NIH for expanded access, and we're asking for 25 million for the FDA to research, for research that will help get new treatments and cures and enhance people with ALS faster. So it was pretty quick. So I wanna make sure I go to the next slide and do an overview of everything. So the Dear Colleague letter for this year that is currently out, it focuses on increased investment in ALS for all the areas that we've asked for to find treatments and cures, to reduce the number of new cases, and increase the length and quality of life for every American living with ALS. How do we do it? In these items, for 80 million at the Department of Defense, 150 million at the NIH, 15 million at the CDC, um, and fully fund Act for ALS, which is a lot easier to say, um, but those are the two programs that fully funding really gets to at um, NIH and FDA. So that is the overview of what the ALS Dear Colleague is this year. And we hope you listen in and figure, see how you can engage and tell Congress to make these asks too. Thanks, Denise. Already getting questions about the uh, Dear Colleague letter. So we'll have more on that in the next Q&A session. Uh, but I'm happy now to introduce uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, an outstanding ALS advocate, uh, Steve Kowalski. Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Happy first full day of spring. Uh, again, my name is Steve, and I'm living with ALS, um, and I live with my family in Boston, Massachusetts. But today, I come to you from Naples, Florida. I uh, wanted to get some warmer weather under my belt, so I headed down south. Um, spring is a time of hope, and um, I had a VP in my last job often remind me when I was overly hopeful that, uh, Steve, hope is not a strategy. But, you know, hope can become a strategy by advocating, in my opinion. In June, when we were all last together, I was asked to speak about why I advocate, what I've learned so far, and in my view, the future of our advocacy efforts. Since last year, I've joined the ALS uh, Public Policy Committee to bring a patient's voice, a perspective, and my lived experience to the group that Nancy and Jesse co-chair. Today, I was asked to make a few brief comments on uh, raising awareness. We all know the Ice Bucket Challenge was by far the biggest awareness raising campaign for ALS. We need to not forget about that, but constantly continue to build upon that success by asking others to become ALS advocates. And when we have the opportunity, making the asks to our congressional leaders. We all have a common goal. It's been articulated many times today already, but in review to find new treatments and cures, optimize current treatments and care, and improve the quality of life for those of us living with ALS. I think we'll, you would all agree that advocate, advocacy is an ongoing process, and it really will never end until we end ALS. How can we widen our reach and bring others under our tent? As pals and cows, we all have a network of family and friends. In my experience, my family and friends were very eager upon my diagnosis and even to this day are very eager to help. Some important ways I think we can um, ask our supporters and our circle of family and friends to help us is to first register to become an advocate on the ALS advocacy website. We need to use the Action Center to review the issues, learn about what our learn about our elected officials 
and take action in support of individuals like me living with ALS. And of course, when the opportunity presents itself, meet with our congressional offices or state legislators, either in person or via video conference to tell our stories and make our important asks. And as Nancy started the day off by asking each of us to invite five people to join us, we need to build a local team at every state level as we begin to prepare for our statewide initiatives. So as Denise just outlined, the ALS Dear Colleague letter is up on the ALS website and is the ask of the day. And I encourage everybody to not only click and have that and sign off on that letter to be sent to your congressional leaders, but like I said before, ask others in your network to do the same so that we have the numbers on our side to let Congress know the immediacy and the importancy, important, um, importancy of, of those like me who are battling ALS and want to live as long as possible. I thank you for your time and Jeremy, back to you. Thanks for that, Stephen. Thanks for sharing uh, your story, your personal experience with ALS and the importance of having a strong community, passionate advocates to advance ALS research. Now let's hear a quick word from another dedicated advocate who is sure to inspire us all. The ALS community definitely needs all the help that they can get from, from Congress and there's important legislation that, um, that they can help out with and make life better for people with ALS and those who care for them. And we're now going to hear from Daniel Kramer, Associate Director for Congressional Affairs, and Dustin Perchel, Director of Advocacy Engagement and Mobilization. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Tamara. If we could go to the next slide. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, my story with ALS is a deeply personal one. Back in November of 2021, I lost my mom, um, Ann Kramer, as so many effectively knew her, knew her as. Miss Ann um, to ALS. And the day of her diagnosis um, was the day that I really wanted to utilize my experience in advocacy and congressional affairs to really push forward um, research into ALS and ultimately find new treatments and a cure. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in today because your advocacy, you tuning into this call means so much to me personally. Now, I wanted to just go over pretty briefly here a sort of guideline that I follow when I go in to meet with congressional offices, when I'm sending emails, or when I'm writing a letter to them. And it's this three-step process called the head, the heart, and the hand. We begin with the head because congressional staff and members have described to me that working in Congress is sort of like rapidly flipping through channels on a TV. One second you're watching a comedy show, the next it's drama, and then next it's a home improvement show. But for them, the channels are legislation um, and the genres are infrastructure, uh, health, um, the economy. So it's really important that when we first reach out to an office, we frame what we're here to talk with them about today. And I usually do this in meetings or in a letter by saying, I'm here with the ALS Association and we're here to find new treatments and a cure for ALS. The second part is the heart. And this is really the crux of your argument. It is where you get to share your experience. And it shows everybody that's in the room that you are the expert. You know ALS better than anybody else. And nobody in that room is gonna know it as well as you do. And they're not gonna know everything that they can do for you unless you share what that real world effect of ALS is. And the truth of the matter is, is that those members of Congress and their staff need to know what the effect the decisions in the halls of Congress actually makes on the individual. So when it comes to an ask for appropriations, you can say that we don't have enough treatments available. We don't have a cure for ALS yet. And for me, I would have done anything to get more months with my mother, Miss Ann. And it's just really important to, to get that across. And then finally, 
after you have them hooked, because you told your experience, you need to make the ask of that office. Really the ask is what they can do, what bills they can pass, what funding they can secure. And you tie that back into your lived experience with ALS. So that's just a quick little overview of something that I think is really important. And my colleague Dustin is going to share a bit more as to how we can actually tie that into the advocacy action we're going to be asking everyone to take today. So with that, um, next slide, Tamara and Dustin, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Daniel. And it's great to, to be with everyone today. Um, this is my favorite part of the program. It's been a great program so far. We've learned a lot. We've heard from a lot of great folks. But now it's time to take action. It's time to make our voices heard on Capitol Hill. It's time to make sure the voices of the ALS community are heard on Capitol Hill. So we have several ways that you can get to our action alert. Um, you can go online at als.org backslash action alert. We've made it really easy. You can actually text research to 855-469-2621, or you can pull up your phone and scan the QR code and it'll take you directly to our action alert. Um, and I should mention, we're gonna have this information on the bottom of all the slides going forward so that you can kind of follow along so we can all take action together and send a unified message to Congress on our ALS research asks and to sign the ALS Dear Colleague letter. So with that, Tamara, let's go to the next slide. All right, so if you have never taken action um, with us before and you go to the action alert, then you'll, you will have to enter in some information. If you have already, take an action. This may be already pre-populated and you may go directly to the alert. So if you're coming for the first time, you have to enter your first name, your last name, your email, and your home address. The home address is really important so they can locate your member of Congress. Now you can also enter your cell phone number and you can sign up for a text advocacy alerts. You can also um, write in your connection or select your connection to ALS as well. Um, and then you would hit submit and the next slide and it will take us to the action alert. And so what you will see is the action will be personalized um, with your member of Congress right there on the top. And what you'll see for most of you will be this. It will, it will tell you about the letter and it will have all the details um, in there. As, as Danny was mentioning, you know, kind of the ask, we've taken care of that for you specifically. Now for about 51 of you, there actually will be a thank you message because those folks have already signed on. So you're able to send a thank you message to those folks. So that's great. Now. When you see this, you'll actually see the subject line and then a, a second box on the main message are kind of white. Those can be customized. And that's where you can really personalize this message and make it impactful for your member of Congress. And so you can edit the subject, um, but really want to focus on the, the, the second box there and kind of focus on what Daniel was talking about. Talk about the impact of ALS, talk about the need for research, how they can help. And you can see we have some language in there. If you like that language, you can keep it. If you want to remove it and put your own in, please. This is, this is your message. This is your letter to your member of Congress. Um, and so what you'll see then is you scroll all the way down after you entered in your message, um, you'll see your full name and then of course your address. And then you'll want to hit the submit button and then that will send your letter. So um, with that, we'll go to the, the next slide. So when, once you're done, you will be taken actually to this specific screen and you'll have another opportunity to kind of amplify your message even beyond the letter that you just sent. So if you have a Twitter account, um, then what you would do is we've already kind of pre-populated a tweet. And so you select the blue button which has the Twitter logo and the send on there. And so when you click on that button, you'll get a pop-up box. And on that pop-up box, you either have to sign into Twitter if you have an account or it'll be the pre-populated message that you see there. So if we can go to the next slide. So this is the pre-populated tweet. You know, as your constituent and someone impacted by ALS, I urge and I'll have your member already tagged with their appropriate Twitter handle to support ALS research. Add your name to the FY 2024 ALS Appropriations Dear Colleague Letter today, and it'll have a link directly to a PDF of that letter. So that when you send it out on Twitter and the staff member or the member of Congress actually sees this tweet, they can actually view the letter directly and it has our hashtag fund ALS research already incorporated. So then, you know, you just click on the blue tweet button and then that will actually post it to your wall and tag your member of Congress to let them know that you're asking them uh, to, to 
sign on to our Dear Colleague letter. All right, um, next slide, please. Okay, and so you might be asking, well, why am I back on this page? Well, for a system to know, since you went outside the system to post a tweet, all you have to do when you come back is click the All Finished button. So you would click on that button, and then you go to the next, next page, Tamara. Perfect. And so then you will get a confirmation message there that says that thank you so much for taking action and taking action together. And you'll see there also are some social share buttons on the bottom. So you can share this on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and I believe even Pinterest it is down there as well. Um, but this is a way that you can then post this and then have other folks take action as well. Just like these uh, URLs, are URLs are active as well. So you can go to ALS.org backslash action center. You can share that with other folks as well. And we actually have this actual out on our Twitter and Facebook platforms right now as well. So if you like or retweet from there, other folks within your networks will be able to see this too. All right, so, and I have one more other advocacy opportunity for you beyond this, taking action and making your voice heard. And that is to also sign up for advocacy text alerts. So you can do that by texting ALS to 855-469-2621. And that will automatically enroll you in that. And I promise we're not gonna spam you. We will only send you the most critical up-to-date advocacy information that is for the ALS community. And so we are really working to build up our capacity in this so we can be rapid action uh, with this. And this will help us both in both federal advocacy and state advocacy as well. So I highly encourage you to sign up for advocacy text alerts. So with that, um, I will uh, turn it over to Ted Jeremy for what we have coming next. Yeah, and Dustin, don't go too far because what we have coming up is uh, you, Daniel, and Denise are going to be joining us for another round of Q&A. Uh, there are a few questions that have been answered in the Q&A chat, so make sure if you're interested in some of those, click on the answered questions if you didn't get a chance. There have been a few questions about resources being made available. This this record this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for subsequent viewing. So uh, all the resources that have been shared here uh, will be subsequently made available to you. So a question for our panelists, uh, as an occupational therapy student with limited income and limited opportunity for travel, how can I best become involved in advocacy to improve the lives of people living with ALS, aside from writing to policymakers? Well, you know, besides the writing to policymakers, well, you can get involved in your community. You can have other folks join us um, in this fight and sign up and, and more voices are, are what we need. There's also the ability to share your story online. We have a new form for that. And your story is power. Your story is really important that members of Congress really know the impact and others are, are made aware of what goes on with ALS as well. And so you can share your story and post there um, and help others um, really impact and share their story as well with members in addition to kind of meeting with them. Because really you wanna build a solid relationship with these lawmakers, these decision makers who make key decisions, not only on funding, but other issues as well. So anytime you can build a relationship with staff in offices at either the state or federal level or the members themselves, that is a big win to really help the ALS community uh, make a real impact. And Denise, you may have some ideas as well. Um, you know what really gets the attention of people on Capitol Hill these days? A phone call too. If you, wow, who would have thought picking up the phone? But that really does make an impact. And when I'm up on the hill, the phone rings, someone has to answer it. Um, and if it's not going directly to voicemail, someone's actually answering it, you can tell. You can just ask to speak to somebody on in their office about ALS research funding, or you know, you could also just leave a message for the member of Congress. I know my old boss would. First thing she did when she walked in the office, like, where are the messages from the constituents? Um, and so we wrote them down and made sure she knew how to contact them if she wanted to do it personally. So you can really do make an impact even with the phone call. Uh, related question, um, and I think it touches on some of the things that Dustin, you and Denise were talking about, but I think it's important to, to both underscore them and think about these in a different way. But what are some good ways to increase awareness in local communities and get people involved in the fight to make ALS a livable disease? Well, May is ALS Awareness Month and that's coming up. And so we will have activities to kind of promote that. But as I said, sharing your story and really getting that out in the, in the community and empowering folks who have been impacted 
by giving them the, the advocacy tools, which is the action center that we have and letting them know about, they can sign up for text alerts. They can join our email program. They can do these things to be connected to their members of Congress and they can build relationships too. We will have um, additional opportunities coming up throughout this year to engage with members of Congress, both virtual and then later in person with district meetings. So please get involved. We need as many people as possible to join us as we go forward and we need everyone. Everyone can join in this as we move together to really kind of tackle ALS and increase funding for research. Yeah, and, and Dustin, I'd like to piggyback off of that. So for me, when my mom was diagnosed with ALS, it was a very scary proposition to kind of put my own personal life out there. Um, sometimes it can be intimidating. Um, and I was, I was nervous about doing that. And one of the things that I found that really you know, made that easier was one, just doing it the first time. I just typed up a long post on Facebook and shared it. And I brought a lot of people in um, to understand what my family was going through, um, what my mom was going through. And from that, there's an outpouring of support and people that want to help um, and, and offer whatever they can for you and your family. And when it comes to that, you're already starting to build a network of people that understand this disease, that understand the impact it has on the family and people that want to do something to help. And for me, I go to um, various different uh, get togethers with other people who serve as caregivers. Um, I go to local events and I not only do fundraising all of that, but I also make sure to highlight, you know, what were the issues me and my family ran into talking about having to make modifications in the home, having to, you know, get my mom to and from appointments, which was very challenging when she lost mobility. Me and my brothers had to take off work. All these little things and all these things that the association is focusing on in an advocacy sense, when we share this with people, they're going to want to get involved. So I would really say that one of the biggest things you can do is take the lead, put yourself out there and tell people what exactly it is you and your family um, are experiencing because those stories, those real lived experiences are the things that not only your friends and family and those in your community will remember, but also those members of Congress and those offices that you meet with. Your experience is what stays. So I'd say I'd say that's something important too. Yeah, and a couple questions that I know have been answered in the uh, in the Q and A box down below, um, but kind of pull together in a, in, a, in a theme. Daniel, you mentioned um, home modifications. We've got some questions coming in about the extent to which that is one of our public policy priorities. Some questions about how do I know who has already signed the Dear Colleague letter? Questions about, um, you know, who is it in the ALS caucus? How can folks find that information in terms of our public policy priorities, who our partners are, uh, and, and who's who's already signed on to all the things that we've asked them to sign on to? Well, that's, that's great, great question, and we have actually been updating our website, so it's at ALS.org slash advocacy. We'll have links to the ALS caucus, which will have the full membership there. And then we also have updated it with uh, signers for the Dear Colleague letter. Um, and I'll turn over to Denise to talk about some of our other partners, but we are actively working to make sure you have the most information you can. So when in doubt, go to ALS.org backslash advocacy, and then always, you can always reach out, out to us at advocacy at ALS.org for that email to get information as well. So Denise? Yeah, a lot of our, our public policies for the federal level and also the state level um, are posted on that website. So if people want to get into uh, a deeper understanding of what we're working on under those pillars that uh, Melanie described earlier, those three buckets that we're really trying to focus on, that is all on our website. It's our public policy priorities. And you can click on there too and learn more. Well, I think that gets to all the questions. Uh, thank you, Dustin, Denise, and um, Daniel for taking time to answer these from our audience. Uh, and thanks to our other panelists for tackling some of those questions in the Q&A chat. Again, if you didn't get a chance, check out the answered questions in there um, and uh, all the questions that we were able to get to today. But I now want to pass things over to Melanie Lenadal to close out our call today. And I know we have one more inspirational video to get to after she wraps us up. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to everyone for participating today. Just so you know, more than 700 people registered for this event, which 
I think demonstrates the sheer power of this community that I personally am so grateful to be a part of. We hope that you leave today feeling as energized as we do about making transformational change. Advocacy matters, your advocacy matters. And that is what has and what will move the needle towards making ALS a livable disease. And this is achievable, but we just have to work all together to do it. Finally, I'd like to thank some people. Thank you to the association staff working behind the scenes to make this happen. Thank you to all our sponsors who are committed to making ALS a livable disease and, and working with us. Finally, thank you for joining us for this important event. We look forward to continuing this fight together. And as Jeremy said, before we go, we have one more video we are leaving with you with today. So stick around to watch and we'll see you all again very soon. I would say um, the ripple effect of this disease is understated. Um, yes, I have been impacted, but the impact of, of, of ALS goes far beyond just me. What gives me hope is that we are not going to give up. We're going to fight, and there are a lot of ALS warriors, including myself, that fight every day.